what uh, Mohan, do you want to, we'll just do a quick round robin of, of intros, uh, who you are, and also what the uh, company that you're representing actually does. Do you want to get started, Mohan? Okay. Thanks, Logan. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> uh, I see Viral just joined, so uh, he's, he's on the panel now, I guess. Uh, my name is Mohan Araf. I am the CEO of Relational AI. Relational AI is uh, building a knowledge graph management system using Julia. Uh, a, you can think of that as a database for knowledge graphs. Uh, if you don't know what uh, knowledge graphs are, I suggest you, you kind of Google around. But the, the idea is that the databases today uh, don't support uh, workloads that, that you do graph analytics or reasoning or machine learning uh, natively to the database anyways, or uh, mathematical optimization. <clears throat> These are all very important workloads that are becoming more and more important as the, um, uh, the world tries to do more, you know, build more intelligent applications and so on. And uh, the combination of the, you know, Julia's support for modeling on the one hand and uh, high performance computing on the other uh, make it really interesting to kind of you know, build a, uh, a systems uh, build a system um, that you know historically would have been built in C++ or more recently would have been built in uh, in, in Rust, for example, uh, to do that in a language like Julia. And um, very briefly about the company, we're 120 people, lean very heavy on engineering, um, something like 90 engineers and scientists. About 60 of those are in R and D. We have colleagues. My colleagues have, I think, an aggregate 35 PhDs. We have uh, five former university professors, uh, so we, we have an academic bent, but also combine that with um, a Silicon Valley <clears throat> exposure uh, with you know engineers and technical fellows that come out of uh, uh, distinguished engineers and technical fellows that come out of organizations uh, here on the West Coast. So uh, that's a bit about us. We're we're pre GA. We're we've got customers that are in production, but we haven't released our stuff to the masses. So. It's hard for people to know what we're up to, but if you want to check it out, um, we have our documentation online. It's it's work in progress, but you can go to docs.relational.ai and, and learn more there. And of course, reach out to me on Twitter or uh, via email or um, you know any way you can get to me. I hope that's what you were looking for, Logan. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I think that gives the the appropriate context for folks. So for, so thanks for the intro and thanks for joining us again early on the on the West Coast time. Um, Jarrett, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, unlike you West Coast folks, I'm in sunny Brooklyn. Uh, and it's a much more leisurely 10 a.m. Um, so thank you for having it so for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to give my background, I'm, I'm Jarrett. I'm the CTO and co-founder of this company called Beacon Biosignals. Um, I was formerly a research engineer at MIT where I did a lot of Julia stuff and, and met a lot of the great people on this call. Um, so just to show a little bit about what Beacon is doing. So we're building a platform for interrogating EEG data uh, at an unprecedented scale and quality uh, with the goal of accelerating the development of treatments for patients suffering from a host of neurological diseases. So we're, we're targeting things like epilepsy, neurodegenerative disease, psychiatric disease, uh, sleep disorders, these sorts of things. Um, so our long-term vision is, is that we would like to supply the world with a brain measurement apparatus that really drives ubiquitous and actionable uh, brain monitoring. Um, we, we believe right now the, the biomarkers that people use to make decisions about uh, brain treatment development are oftentimes really bad surrogates for brain function. Um, and so we're trying to develop meaningful quantitative biomarkers on the EEG data that we work with. Uh, and we're also trying to develop early predictive diagnostics um, that could be used in 2030 and beyond for doing things like understanding whether or not you're at real risk for Alzheimer's or, or these sorts of diseases at a, at a much earlier age where, where certain types of treatments could be way more effective. Um, so I think, uh, I think Mo Moham also mentioned this, but like, I think Julia is a big part of the reason why we're able to even exist. Um, <laughs> I think we wouldn't have been able to move so quickly otherwise with the team that we have. We're about um, 20, 20 or so uh, scientists and engineers uh, mainly and, and, some, and some project management people to keep us on track. Um, but what's really cool, I think, about the environment that Julia has enabled for us is that our domain experts, our data scientists, and our engineers can all tightly collaborate on the development of the core tooling that drives the company. And, and that's super critical for us because so much of, uh, so much of the insight that drives some of the advancements in, in neuroscience and in neurocritical care really, really relies on um, understanding, understanding uh, research and neurology and, and 
and also being able to make computers go fast. And all of these are different skill sets. Um, and and having all of these experts kind of be able to come together and, and, and collaborate is, is something that I think Julia has like really contributed to a beacon. Um, and, it's, and like I said, I feel like it's made the company possible. So um, so yeah, so so we're super excited, obviously, about the about the language. That's kind of obvious, um, but also excited to be on the call with with some other great folks and you know um, friends with all the folks here. So uh, pretty pretty fun to hang out. Yeah, Jared, I love that. Thanks for thanks for giving the context. Um, and and again, congratulations, uh, Beacon Basic. You know, just raised a, a Series A, I think, yep, recently. Right. So huge huge news, and um, I'm excited to see what happens. Thanks, Jared. Uh, Lyndon, you wanna you wanna go next and, and give an overview for for Nvidia? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm Lyndon. I lead the research software engineering team at Nvidia. Um, also on the call, we have Jazz, who's hidden behind the Nvidia Labs logo. There, um, we can maybe throw to her afterwards. Um, but yeah, so uh, Nvidia, I think we're about twelve years old now. Um, we basically apply machine learning, decision-making algorithms to optimize the behavior of the power grid um, to increase efficiency, decrease emissions, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, we are now active all across the U.S. Uh, basically, if you're in the U.S. and getting power, we're probably influencing how that grid's operating, um, which I imagine, well, most of them on the call have power. I don't know where people on the call are actually based, but... Um, yeah, uh, so I think we're around 60 people nowadays. Jazz might be able to correct me. Uh, about 40 of whom are Julia users. Um, yeah, uh, so um, most of, basically all of our core actual algorithms are in Julia. Um, it's a nice language. It's nicer than MATLAB, which we used to use. Um, yeah, uh, offices are in uh, Cambridge, UK, and Winnipeg, Canada. Um, I think there's anything else I should be saying. Uh, well, we can come around to it. Yeah, so just to follow on, thank you, Lyndon, for that intro. My name's Jasmine. I do talent acquisition at Invenia Labs. So how to get a job using Julia is really, I'm on the other side of that. I'm a... Uh helping choose whether you get the job using Julia. Um, yeah, I will say we are, yeah, we are around 70 people now, um, split between Cambridge and uh, and Winnipeg in Canada. I would say um, that, yeah, one of the main exciting things about Invenia is that we're really working on real world problems. And it's great to hear from everyone here because Everyone's working on real world problems. And I think that can be really attractive. If you're a Julia user who's coming from academia, it can be really exciting to get to work on something that's actually going to be making a difference uh, to actual operations. We have a lot of jobs um, available at any one time. So, yeah, if anyone has specific questions about those later or wants to pick up, um, you know, connect on Twitter and talk to us that way, that would be great. Um, we hire on a rolling basis because we are growing really quickly so it's not like we have one vacancy for something and gets filled up by someone you know um so yeah i'm done there <laughs> thank you jasmine and thanks Linda. i think uh I'm, I'm super glad that you were both able to join and looking forward to, to hearing more from you um let's throw things over last but not least to Varal. Varal, how's it going thanks logan can you hear me all right yeah it sounds perfect all right Hey, uh, thanks for organizing this uh, the the Twitter Spaces and uh, and and helping me uh, join this thing. I haven't sort of installed Twitter before this, but this is fantastic. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. And uh, you know, I'm quickly by means of introduction. I'm Viral Shah, one of the creators of the Julia language, and uh, also co-founder and CEO of Julia Computing. And it's just really exciting to see, uh, you know, uh, see, see this thing come together, see how many people are interested, are curious about how to get jobs with Julia, how to get jobs, you know, building Julia itself and so on and so forth. So I'll share some of my perspective about what we are doing and then, uh, you know, uh, we can we can take it from there. Um, at, uh, at Julia Computing, we founded Julia Computing. It was founded by the four creators of Julia itself. So myself, Alan Edelman, Jeff Bizanson, Stefan Kropinski. And 
it's i would say that it's probably uh, the company with the highest number of open source julia contributions uh, in terms of the number of contributors involved and so on and so forth so if you're interested in building julia itself julia computing is a great place to be at uh, but increasingly we are also sort of pushing forward on modeling and simulation and sort of you know this whole premise that julia is here to fix the world's problems at large as uh, as as the folks from Invenia just spoke about and Jared spoke about and and Molham did that we really are here to solve you know some of the most challenging problems uh, in the world and uh, modeling and simulation in my opinion is one of the best ways to do that by pushing science forward um we're building a composable scientific machine learning um you know the suite of products and i will i, I can speak more about those a little bit later um but this, you know, maybe this is probably a sufficient starting point. Yeah, no, that's awesome, Veral. Thanks for thanks for being here and for um, for sharing that perspective. I think, yeah, we'll we'll definitely dive more into the details. Um, I, I think perhaps the the first question, and for all, maybe you want to kick off with this one just to get the discussion going. Is you know, when you're you know working with folks in the Julia community, what are some of the things that you're looking for when you're trying to decide? Hey, you know, I've worked with this person in the Julia community. You know, are they the right person, perhaps, to to bring in um, to my company and actually have them work here? That's a, that's a great question. So, you know, as 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 many of you probably already know, right? That uh, Julia Computing uh, already sort of has a lot of people from the Julia community. And hiring from the community is great, right? Because you see people who have, you know, you see their GitHub contributions before you've sort of met with them at JuliaCon, you, you know, and engage with them extensively over GitHub. And so in general, like, you know, the hardest parts of, uh, of, of a job interview process, right? Like at the end of the day as an employer, you know, what, what are you trying to figure out, right? You want to build the best team, you want to bring someone who's going to be compatible with the team, who's going to be an amazing contributor and, you know, create an environment for that person to flourish and meet their own career goals, right? And a, a lot of the time that's spent, is, you know, when, when you try to sort of figure out if, if, if something is a good match is, is literally like, do you know enough about the person or not? And what, you know, the open source community enables us is that we already know each other so well. So it just becomes that much easier to hire someone um, and focus on you know uh, on the rest of the technical uh, things that 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 are that are entailed instead of sort of trying to answer some of these more difficult questions, which is which is what most interviews spend a lot of time trying to figure out um, on both sides, right? For the person who is interviewing and for the company as well. So uh, that said, I don't think that you know at, at least at Julia Computing, right? We don't only hire from the community. We generally say that Julia is now widely you know used widely enough is taught at enough number of schools at all the top schools uh, around the world that we generally focus on skill that on on a person's skill as a scientist or a programmer depending on the part of the company we are uh, absorbing them into for example julia hub is a cloud platform that we are building for you know we we hope to make it the best place to run julia anywhere right so that's where a traditional cloud engineer might join julia but if you're joining a modeling and simulation team you might be, uh, you know, an engineer by training, right? You might be a mechanical engineer, you might be an electrical engineer, um, or you might be someone who's working with, you know, UIs, right? And in all of these cases, we don't necessarily always see that there are people in the community who are the right uh, persons for the work or, or w what have you, right? So we really like to open up the, um, uh, the, the pool, right? And then make sure that we get the highest number of applicants for a position and get people excited even outside of the community, because Julia is kind of, you know, growing rapidly, it's million users out there, right? And and there's just sort of so much that we all need to build. All of these companies are growing so rapidly. So maybe that's a long answer to your question, but if someone's from the community, I think, you know, it's it's just that much easier. If someone's on GitHub, that's that much easier, but it's no, by no means a requirement. And uh, Julia is easy enough to learn uh, once someone starts working on, on it. Yeah, bro, I love that answer. I think uh, sort of leveraging the community work and the open source work that people are doing as a as sort of a, a signal, I think is, you know, that makes total sense to me. Linda, do you want to jump in and um, and add something? Uh, yeah, um, echoing, uh, yeah, Varel's point. Um, 
So I think one thing to note, uh, I did a bit of a straw count um, at Invenia and of our people who uh, like work in Invenia, less than 10% knew Julia when they started. Um, so like we love working with the community. We love uh, engaging the community. We do a lot of open source and often we do, you know, have our open source contributors who will be like, hey, you're looking for a job? Uh, reach out to them and kind of poke towards it. And as I said, yeah, love seeing anyone who does have um, that background. Uh, but because Julia is just so easy to teach, um, I think in many ways that can uh, sometimes set people up for a bit of a trap in the interview. If you think, uh, I don't know, people come in and be thinking, oh, I'm, I've got a real leg up because I already know Julia. Uh, but, well, it's just so easy to teach. So often uh, when we're looking to hire, we're often looking for more fundamental skills, um, especially for, say, uh, power systems engineers. You know, it's awesome if they know Julia, and Julia is a great language to do power systems work in. Um, but more importantly, are they a good power system engineer? That kind of comes comes first. Um, so I guess that's one tip for uh, when you're applying for the job. Don't think that you've already got it sold just because you know Julia. Um, it's great, definitely a solid plus, but not the be all and end all. Yeah, Lyndon, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I, I can I can totally understand how no, potentially how knowing not just Julia can can really be the piece that seals the deal. So so thanks for sharing that. Uh, Moham or Jarrett, anyone want to jump in and talk about? Yeah, either of you, whichever whichever works. Moham, I, I, perhaps you I hear some hear Moham's thoughts. I have my own, but okay, uh, Moham, I'll you want to take it? Uh, sure. So. So at our stage uh, of the company, like I said, we're 120 people. We're, we're, um, it's very important for us that we work with people who are uh, excited by the mission. Uh, so missionaries, not mercenaries, is, is important to us. Uh, in general, we want people who are really good at what they do. They're high competence, but also uh, you know, low maintenance, uh, self-aware, team players. Uh, that's also, that also makes a big difference. It's sort of someone can fundamentally understands that we can't do what we're trying to do, you know, as a, as a set of individuals, it's really a, a, a team activity uh, in terms of uh, specifically in terms of technical competence, you know, we're looking for people who are compiler writers, who are database kernel writers, people who are good at machine learning, uh, who understand, uh, uh, you know, how to put machine learning systems together and how to use machine learning. Um, so our work is really at the intersection of a lot of different um, sub-disciplines of computer science. Um, you know, knowing Julia is not a, a, a requirement if you're really good at uh, compiler work because, you know, we're building a declarative or relational programming language using Julia. So that would be, you know, that would be very helpful. Um, and, you know, more and more as we work with Jeff and Baral and, and Kino and, and, and the other, you know, people on the uh, Julia compiler team, we're actually more interested in giving them, you know, more support and working with them to work at the, at the level of Julia itself. Um, so we recently, you know, thanks to uh, an introduction from Baral, recent, recently hired someone who has worked on the internals of Julia and added the, the multi-threading support and so on. So we want to really help moved the core of Julia forward as well. We, um, we know that there's a lot to do and, and that Julia computing <clears throat> shouldn't carry the entire load on behalf of the community. And we want to support Julia computing that way. So those are high level thoughts. That's, that's a very good sentiment, Mulham, I think. And uh, it's, it's, it's important for everyone to know, right? That all the companies that, that are here, all of us have the same mission. You know, even though all of us have our own businesses and our own products to build, there is a common underlying mission of of making Julia better and pushing Julia forward. I, I think this is, to me, it's like, this is what makes open source communities so fascinating. I, I think actually, you know, running a, a large organization that, that uh, it is, uh, has its own kind of in, internal operations is, it makes it even more fascinating, I think, to understand what, what it looks like when a decentralized community comes together to like uh, feed, feed their efforts back into common projects. I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting when you see this etiquette that's that's arose sometimes naturally, sometimes via uh, committee or via community organization, uh, where successful projects are really born in an environment that incentivizes 
asynchronous collaboration um, and and built upon tooling like GitHub, right? That like facilitates these interactions between people that, that fundamentally oftentimes don't know each other, right? Um, I, I remember the first kind of magical experience it was to have somebody contribute to a package that I, I had published. Um, and I think I think the Julia community is, has done well at like providing a home for that and an ecosystem for that. Um, and I think you can see it in the way that that we interact, I guess, as, as, as companies that operate in the community. Um, I think it, at, at Beacon, it's something that if we are hiring from the community, we definitely look for. Uh, we look for folks that have some of that same ethos of, of kind of having a locus of initiative that, that, that they, they can take when they see a problem, um, they feel empowered to go out and fix it. And I think it's, it's kind of the, it, it's been a large driver of the culture that, that we've tried to adopt internally, um, building, building kind of ecosystems of libraries that everybody can feel uh, it, like I said, empowered to contribute to. Um, and I, I think, I think, uh, I also would echo what, what everybody else was saying that, that there are skill sets that right now aren't super, uh, available in the Julia community that are obviously super important to, to achieving, uh, something big in the world. <laughs> um, especially, especially, you know, distributed, uh, cloud experience is, is super important to us. Um, UI development. And I think what's cool, like, like the others were saying about Julia is that it is super easy for folks with different skill sets to bring those skill sets uh, and make use of them quite quickly and readily in Julia without needing to necessarily overcome a huge uh, learning curve or, or a hurdle. And it's especially true when you already have an environment of, of folks that once again, I think have this open source mindset of like active collaboration um, and pairing up to help each other asynchronously and, and, and these sorts of nice things. It, it like, it, it greases the, the intellectual wheels as it, as it were, I think. Um, and, and I, I think, you know, a, a, in some weird way, I, I think Julia's package management capabilities and the fact that it's package manager is so nice. Uh, and, and the fact that, uh, you know, the co-founders of the language really put a lot of thought, I think, into how, um, how different, uh, libraries should be published and and can and and can be developed independently from the base language like that ethos like has just I really think it's just like spread out from the core language uh, in a really in a really great way that's that's really I, I think it's yeah it's served as a model for Beacon internally so um. yeah Jared I love that point I think <laughs> anytime in a conversation people are talking about things that they love about Julia the the package manager is is a common thread among those conversations. So thanks for thanks for hitting on that point. Um, we we have uh, Max here. Max, do you want to unmute? Give us a, a quick um, intro and also uh, talk for a second about what uh, Zapata Computing does. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Logan. My name is Max Rayton. I lead the quantum software team at Zapata Computing. So we um, our mission is to help enterprises solve some of their hardest computational problems using quantum computers, whether it's in uh, machine learning or optimization or modeling of problems in physics or finance. Uh, and so what uh, the quantum software team does, we're just one of many teams at Zapata, um, is to build tools to help scientists and engineers make the most out of uh, quantum computers that we have. And um, so I think that, that Zapata, we found ourselves uh, over the last several years to be um, somehow very aligned with the Julia community in the sense that uh, you know, there's, there's like um, a common interest in tackling some of these uh, very challenging uh, problems that, that become very dependent on like some specialized knowledge of a domain and the ability to write code that's uh, very performant. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're a company that's uh, growing and hiring many people in, in different roles. Uh, we have, you know, across the company, there's people using... Um, many different languages and tools for different projects and different parts of our platform. Um, but Julia is, is one in particular that, that at least I'm personally very excited about for many of the reasons that you all have already mentioned. Yeah, I love that, Max. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Um, I, I think one question that I'm, I'm interested to hear from folks, and I don't have anyone specific in mind for this question, but, and, and Mohan, you kind of touched on this uh, with respect to you know, hiring great compiler engineers, but what what's sort of the broad strokes approach for potentially folks who are listening to this and, you know, they don't have deep expertise in Julia, they haven't sort of made any, you know, foundational contributions to the Julia ecosystem. 
how can, you know, what are some of the other, again, signals or peripheral skills that those folks can learn um, to, to potentially be well suited for a job at uh, one of the companies that you all represent? I can, tr I can try, uh, you know, uh, say a little bit here. So I, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, absolutely right, right? That, you know, not everyone is a compiler engineer and, and everyone should not be a compiler engineer either, right? Um, it, is, it is true that the Julia community and uh, the Julia project needs more compiler engineers at this point. Um, but uh, if you look at sort of the skills uh, that are required to build the kinds of products across all these companies, right? And I'll sort of say a little bit more about Julia computing, but I think what I, what I say here is applicable to all of us here is that the common theme is that these are deeply technical companies building products you know using you know deep science or machine learning or you know uh, you know something incredibly technical right and uh, you know to linden's point right that what what really sort of helps is if a person is deeply technical cares about you know their area their field um, is willing to learn new and interesting things Teaching them Julia is the easiest part of the story, right? And and uh, you know my my guarantee or or your money back is that if you if you haven't learned Julia yet, it's only a week for you to learn it. And uh, you know if if you don't if you don't successfully learn Julia within a week, then I'll give you your money back. Nice. Um, <laughs> money back only a few minutes into the call, I love it. I, <laughs> that's a it's a really good, really good observation. I mean, I, just look at this call, right? Like I, I think Julia centric companies. Um, are generally on the cutting edge of, of kind of each of their industries. Like we have next-gen database development, next-gen brain health, next-gen power grid and all its next-gen quantum. And, and of course, Julie Computing, which is basically next-gen scientific computing. Like uh, these are domain areas that I think a lot of people are, are peripherally interested in and, and some people very interested in. Um, and I, I think it, in some ways, even if you don't know Julia, like you might have a skill set that could really push um, push developments in, in any of these areas. So, so I would say, I would say that folks, even if you're not like, you know, super into Julia itself, if you're really into one of these domain areas, um, then that's, that's an incredible draw for us at Beacon, at least, um, folks who have a really strong neuroscience background, oftentimes, um, in our, in our, you know, the, the we like to say the types of folks who are nerd sniped in their PhDs into doing a lot of programming, uh, and, 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 you know, caring about the research, but also, also making their code go fast, uh, much to the chagrin of their advisors sometimes. Like th this, is the, this is maybe the profile of, like a, of a research scientist or a neuroscientist at, at Beacon. But, um, but, but yeah, like, like we've, we've said before, I guess, in this call, like um, having, having folks with traditional engineering skill sets really important. I think, I think personally that there's a, a great avenue for uh, doing the types of engineering you would be doing with a, with a system like Spark in Julia, um, and I think a lot of folks actually in the open source world, and I and I and I would bet a lot of the lurkers, like maybe people that that read posts and 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 follow up on projects but don't contribute, are really interested in doing like large scale data engineering with Julia. And I know Julia Computing is working on products that help with that too. Um, but I think getting people involved from those communities that otherwise might not be looking at, at at Julia that way, or they might not have the wherewithal to know what's going on in the Julia verse. Uh, getting engaged with them via the fact that we have such interesting domains and we're we're all at the cutting edge of them, I think that's a, like a huge, going to be a huge draw for the development of the community and uh, and also hopefully is a huge draw for people to to reach out to us. Can I? Um, so I agree with everything that's said. I also want to also highlight the the other perspective on this, which is it's been great for our company. Um, to be working with Julia because there are lots and lots of people who love Julia out there who are very good at what they do, uh, but they don't get to use Julia for their day job. And they want to use, you know, Julia all the time, not just uh, personally, they want to use it at work. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's allowed us to, you know, put a few job postings out there and just get a lot of really wonderful candidates that, you know, we want to hire everyone eventually, uh, uh, all the good ones anyway. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's an inherent advantage, at least at this stage, uh, uh, for us, because we get so many people who love Julia, who want to use it all the time that become interested in the work we're doing in a relational AI because of that. We've, we've hired seven or eight people out of the community that I think most of you would know are fairly visible. So, um, 
so it works both ways. If you if you have, you know, if you don't know Julia, uh, but you have skills that matter to the company, like you know, skills in power engineering or skills in in quantum or skills in database stuff, I think it makes sense uh, uh, to think about us because we can teach you the Julia very quickly. And if you have Julia but don't necessarily have the domain, um, I think we can still uh, have uh, 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 you know reason to talk. Uh, because the we do need Julia expertise and Julia skills, and you get to do Julia day in day out uh, when you're working at relational AI. Yeah, Jasmine, you want to jump in? Yeah, so I'd add to that that uh, Invenia again, like you say, Mohan, for us, it's like very. It's great if you have the foundational skills and the kind of expertise. It's great if you already know Julia, both those things are fantastic. If you are coming from the Julia perspective and you're looking specifically for companies that are using Julia in all sorts of different domains, I think it's really helpful for us that we're not just looking for kind of your technical knowledge, but also your kind of way of thinking and your attitude towards the kind of problems you're approaching. And for that, it's really interesting to know why you like Julia why you want to be using this in your day job. Um, what do you find intriguing about it? What do you find efficient about it? Um, and is using Julia the kind of make or break for whether or not you are, you know, is that a priority in what you're looking for in your work? Because that can tell us a lot about why you actually want this role and the kind of attitude you're going to have when you come up against things in the role. Yeah, I think that's an interesting perspective. I think um, I, I can totally understand where you're coming from as far as, you know, again, at, you know, truthfully, at the end of the day, Julia is a tool that helps solve a problem. Um, and is it is it the tool that you're most interested in? Is it the is it the overall company's mission that you're most interested in? So I think having a um, sort of a balanced perspective on that can, from a candidate's perspective, uh, be really helpful in making sure that you end up landing that um, that job offer. So I, I love that, uh, that perspective. I wanted to ask um, another question around f sort of for students, somebody who perhaps, again, doesn't have sort of this, this deep professional background, any, any suggestions on, on pathways? One of the things that comes to my mind is getting involved in, in Google Summer of Code, Julia Summer of Code. Um, any, any other sort of suggestions or success stories from any of the companies you all work with as far as getting students in the door who perhaps, again, don't have that, uh, that deep professional background? I would I would immediately say that what you just said, Logan, is a great suggestion. So Google Summer of Code, Julia Summer of Code. Um, I think when we see folks who who have gone through those programs, oftentimes that's a it's a oftentimes those programs are a great way to onboard new people into the community in general. Um, and like we've talked about, folks who have kind of exhibited uh, initiative and and have made a lot of contributions in the community are, are obviously super super great candidates. Um, I'd also say at Beacon, uh, we we have uh, we have internships. And I'm sure some of the other companies do too, um, and so that can be kind of a low stakes way for somebody to try out what it's like to use Beacon and or use Julia in, in Beacon's environment at least. Um, and I'm sure I'm, I'm I'm curious as to to hear the other speakers' thoughts on what they think about like Julia based internships. Um, I'll also call out just uh, just to follow up a little bit on the on the previous conversation that you know a lot of the companies here are are, are startups. Or, or, or smaller companies. Obviously, Invenia is a bit more mature, been around for, for, for quite some time. But, um, but there are also opportunities these days that, from what I'm hearing from candidates, to, to work uh, at, at you know more larger companies um, using Julia. And, and maybe this is actually to my disadvantage to, <laughs> to bring this up. But, but I think you know not a, a small startup is not the right place for everybody. But, um, but it's what. Yes, yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> but 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 I think it's I think it's important for the growth of the growth of the language and growth of the community for folks to realize that like it's not just a startup thing anymore. You know, this is like this is something where there there are teams inside of larger organizations that are like betting everything on Julia. Uh, I think to to make their projects run faster uh, within a larger context, and and I think and I think that bodes well for for folks like us, right? Um, but, but yeah, I'm curious to hear what other folks think about internships, opportunities for students, that sort of thing. You know, I, so, um, I personally spend, you know, time with GSOC every year and, um, you know, many folks at Julia Computing do. And, and of course, uh, many people on this call are, are, you know, engaged with GSOC and JSOC 
Um, as for, for those of you who might not know what JSOC is, it's the Julia Summer of Code, which is sort of the overflow from Google Summer of Code because we always have more demand than we can uh, than, than Google can meet. Um, and, and hopefully that, you know, that, that every year we've had to do more. And in many cases, uh, what I have noticed is that people end up becoming longtime contributors uh, after going through GSOC. And in many cases, Julia Computing has hired people, uh, you know, who sort of, you know, started out with GSOC, continued in the community. You know, sometimes we've even hired people directly out of GSOC, uh, you know, if they were sort of graduating right after that, you know, it was a lot the last internship and they were just going to graduate turned out to be well. Uh, we ended up hiring them directly. Um, we often do internships at Julia Computing, but because of the effort that we spend on GSOC and JSOC, those tend to be more selective and just fewer in number. Uh, but I, I would also echo what, what Jared said, right? That every company is doing stuff with Julia. And I have some data which I cannot share publicly here, but effectively I have seen Julia downloads from all the largest Fortune 500 companies, like like a large number of them, um, including some of the you know the most well known Silicon Valley companies uh, who who won't probably say it publicly, um, but but I have seen them. I have met some of those users, and uh, it's if if you sort of go around on Indeed.com and just put Julia in there, you'll just see that it's popping up in everything, right? That people are just you know, nowadays they you know they used to say Python or R, right? And now they'll always be like, oh, Python R or Julia. And increasingly, I'm seeing sort of certain kinds of uh, openings that are Julia only, like they, they want skills for people who are familiar with particular kinds of Julia packages. Like, you know, jump tends to be one that I see a lot, for example. Um, so it's it's just exciting. So yeah, as a part of, we've also found that internships have been um, a great way to bring people into the company. We've had a long history of having many research interns, as well as interns more in engineering and and other non-technical roles as well. Um, and, and many of them, you know, have continued either as full-time employees or continue to engage as collaborators or part-time in other ways. So we found it's a really helpful way to, to bring people into the company. Uh, the other thing I was going to suggest for people who are, you know, making that jump from being uh, a student or being in academia and industry. So when I went through that transition, going from being a postdoc in industry, um, you know, one thing that people told me to do and that I found was very helpful was just to, to go out and find people who have the job that you would like to have and go talk to them, whether it's friends or classmates or people you find on Twitter or LinkedIn and, you know, ask them about, uh, what was the pathway that led them to their job? What does their day-to-day -day look like? What skills do they find the most valuable? Um, and as you, you go through that, you know, you'll, you'll start to learn some very valuable things like, oh, such and such company is hiring or, um, you know, or here's an open source package that you might really want to contribute to. So for example, if somebody was looking for jobs in, um, you know, software for quantum computing, I might say things like, oh yeah, you might want to check out, for example, um, you know, the Quantum Open Source Foundation, which has a nice mentorship program, or make contributions to packages like uh, Yao.jl, or look at internships at companies like Zapata and Quera, which also uses Julia very heavily. But that's very specific to quantum computing, right? And so the answers you get might be, might be a little bit different depending on what field, what kind of role specifically you're looking for. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective, Max. And anyone else want to want to jump in? I know we, we keep losing uh, Lyndon, so sorry about that, Lyndon. Moham, you want to? I just this? wanted to say that we also hire a lot of interns. Um, basically, we, we hire, try to hire as many as we can and still have time to provide good internship experiences for them. A lot of our interns uh, come from um, our research col collaborations with academia. We um, we're less effective and would like to get better at hiring, you know, interns sort of in more traditional ways. Uh, but if you are in a PhD program uh, or a graduate program and uh, you're doing research in any of the topics I mentioned, like machine learning and, and AI in general and compilers and databases, um, we're probably uh, at most two de degrees of separation apart uh, through those communities and, um, you know, very, very supportive of doing things via internships. A lot of a lot of the more senior people at Relational AI started out as interns, uh, um, you know, seven, eight years ago uh, when we were at a company called Logic Blocks, and that was the, the, the company we worked in. A lot, many of us worked in before uh, we started Relational AI. So, 
uh, internships are a great way to get to know us and us to get to know you as well. Yeah, I'll just follow up with that, like, especially what you mentioned about PhD candidates. Uh, we found that internships can also be a great way for folks on an academic track to get their feet wet in a more industrial environment, but still at a very highly fast paced and, and collaborative and, and kind of science based environment um, where we obviously value research and a lot of what we do is research. Um, it, you know, we, we <laughs> I'll say we've managed to c convert a few folks off the academic path, um, which is great great for us and I think great for, for them too. But, um, but and, and of course, ac academia is uh, awesome as well. But, but I think uh, for folks who are, who are in PhD programs or in master's programs and aren't quite sure whether or not industry might be for them, um, internships, I would say, are, the, are by far and away the best way to, to try that out. And it's, like I said, it's low stakes um, and high yield, I think, as an experience. So. Yeah, Jared, I'm, I'm wondering if we can, uh, and as folks might have seen, we keep losing people because uh, the app and during Twitter spaces is very buggy and it crashes and bad things happen. So again, if that happens to you, feel free to join back in and request to speak. But um, Jared, can we double tap on what, what are some of the other skills and, and things you're looking for from folks who, who are specifically coming from academia? Because at least when I look at the Julia community, I see that there's a huge presence of folks who have that more traditional academic background um, versus, you know, deeper industry experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think uh, I think one of the biggest things um, and, and actually I think one of the huge kind of advantages is it, it, depending on the kind of field that you're in and the, and the, the background that you're coming from. Um, this is really highly dependent on the academic community and, and, you know, the group that you're in and these sorts of things. But um, one thing that, that is really important for us is open collaboration um, and, and, and being able to work in such a way that, you know, a person, I mean, obviously we all know each other at Beacon, but uh, being able to work in such a way that like a person that you don't know could possibly make a contribution. I mean, I think this is, this is the thing that drives success in the open source community, but I also think it's the thing that drives success in a company that's like highly asynchronous and, and functioning well. Um, and so in the, in the academic world, there are some communities that excel at this and there are some communities that maybe are, are much more uh, siloed and, and kind of are, are paper, paper churning focused. Um, and so I, I think one, one possible advantage of, of, of moving to a company like, like Beacon or any of the companies on this call is I think it will give you an opportunity to, to much more directly flex those collaboration skills um, and be able to work with other people, not, not necessarily just having, you know, your code or and having it be passed from grad student to grad student or postdoc to postdoc, which can often unfortunately happen in academia. Um, so folks who are really interested, I think, on, on reusability of, of, of tooling um, and on that type of collaborative aspect, that's super important to us um, for, for folks to have that have that interest and then folks that actually have that experience coming from the academic world, especially if it's open source, that's, that's also uh, definitely a, a plus. Yeah, that's great. Lyndon, Max, Moham, anything uh, you want to add on the transition from academia to potentially industry and, and what you all are looking for in that? Uh, yeah, I, um, I think something that's often considered weakness in academia is not going deep. Um, your typical academic is, you know, super, super expert on just one thing. Um, and definitely, if you're the kind of academic who's just, oh, I'm just interested in so many things, uh, and you've got like some breadth to your knowledge, um, that's a huge plus. Uh, and it's definitely starting to like not be, not hide in the interview, um, showing off that you have these other skills in these other areas, you know, this and that and the other thing. Because, um, I mean, if we think about it, like my PhD is in, um, what was it? I can't even remember the time anymore. Uh, the uh, surprising capacity of linear combinations of embeddings for representations of meaning, um, which is a pretty specific thing. Um, odds are, unless you have a very specific uh, PhD that happens to be incredibly well aligned, you're not going to be using anything you directly uh, learned there. But showing you have the breadth of skills to bring these other things in and show how they're connected, um, you're very valuable. Yeah, and I, I, um, I think something that um, might be unique to us or the group here is we, uh, you know, we, we can kind of support someone who's trying to figure that out. 
So, you know, um, academia is great for a lot of people. And, uh, and if that's what you want to do, there's, there are ways of working together where you stay in academia and you just join our research network, which is, a, you know, an additional 20 or so people that we, you know, we work with. Uh, and we can, you know, add industrial relevance to your academic research. And that's, you know, that's great uh, in both directions. Sometimes folks get tired of academia and want to break. So we have um, many examples of professors who, you know, come and join us for a year or two on sabbatical, take a leave of absence, and and then they go back. Uh, and then sometimes they realize, hey, my teaching load, and, uh, you know, in many ways, they get to do more more research and more interesting technical work at uh at our company, uh, which is the motivation for being an academic to begin with. And sometimes when you get senior in academia, you have, you spend a lot of time writing proposals and, and teaching large classes and, you know, doing um, uh, administrative work that you, you lose the connection with the research. So, uh, you know, part of our value proposition to people in academia is that we can kind of be, be very flexible with them in terms of the arrangements. Uh, that we can put in place. And, and, and that's been great for us too. Just like the Julia community feeds us a lot of talent, I think the academic community feeds uh, into what we do at Relational AI in some really uh, interesting and not necessarily uh, conventional ways. That's, a, that's such a great point. I, I, think, um, I think one of the things that when I was at MIT was such a huge boon for, for grant writing and, and for like, uh, you know, acquiring funding for the really interesting projects was having industry sponsors. Um, and, and I think, uh, I think, yeah, exactly like Moham said, if you, if you have an interesting project and you want to, uh, you think is, it's better served by being grant funded in academia, like I, I think many of the companies here are very open to being uh, potential industry, industry sponsors or industry collaborators listed on the, on the grant and actually, actually using the, the resources that we have to, to help bring some of these projects to life. Um, and I, I think that's, yeah, that's that's a super cool mode of, of collaboration to bring up, Moham. Yeah, Moham, I, I just wanted to highlight the, I, I think you all have actually had an incredible amount of success with this, like folks in the Julia community, uh, like Mike Innes, who created Flux, and I think he did a lot of the work for Zygote.jl um, is, is part of that research network. I think maybe, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but David Sanders might have been part of that uh, yep. research network. So lots of... Yep amazing folks from the Julia community leveraging that and then potentially, at least in David Sanders case, actually making the jump over and, and becoming a full-time employee. Yeah, that's right. And we, again, it's a great way to uh, work together and collaborate and see what works. And, and we don't have like a, an evil plan here to say, if you join a research network that really we're trying to get you to join the company, we're just trying to create a sustainable arrangement where we have the benefit of your, uh, you know, your uh, shared interest in something that we do. And, uh, you know, and if it's a research collaboration, wonderful. And if it's, you know, eventually uh, joining the, the company and being a you know, part of the core team, that's wonderful too. Yeah, I love that. Um, in, in our last few minutes, I'm wondering if we can wrap up with the, with the topic of, you know, how, and, and folks have sort of touched on this in, in various capacities, but how you all see sort of, your role as uh, as a company using Julia, um, you know, in in the Julia ecosystem as a whole, where are places that you think, uh, you know, these are really great opportunities for us to continue to contribute? Um, I think Moham, I, I've seen some of the work with uh, that Nathan and folks are doing with the the compiler profiler stuff. Uh, I think that PR just got merged. I saw it. Um, so interested to see sort yes. of the, the collaboration opportunities between all of your companies in the community. Yeah, I saw I saw someone celebrating their PR on LinkedIn. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, we, I mean, we want to, you know, we want to earn our, our keep in the community. Like I said earlier, I think uh, to the extent that we can help make Julia itself better for everybody, we do that. Um, you know, we're um, very interested in making those contributions and hiring more, you know, more and more people who spend more and more of their, their time working either on the, the ecosystem in general or the Julia itself. So... We want to be a good, uh, good member of the community. I, I think, like one thing to to observe here is that the, some of the folks on this call, I think, the 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 folks on this call and, and the the folks that are in the, these companies are are some of the people that are best poised um, to develop the kinds of tooling that makes Julia useful in uh, in a in an industrial environment. Um, so there's a lot. 
there's a lot that 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 goes on in terms of integration with with the company's in infrastructure and the way they build their their data infrastructure, especially from the get go. That um, it has deep implications for how you use a tool like Julia in that environment. And I think I think a lot of what um, might not be as available, but definitely way better than it was maybe a couple of years ago, it is like a clear a clear narrative to to folks that aren't already in the community for like how that could work or how that could look. Um, and I but I do think, like I said, I, I think Julia is like super well poised as a as a tool and as a language to facilitate the kinds of data analysis that you would like formerly need something that was much more heavyweight in order in order in order to kind of achieve um so i i you know in, in my mind i would love it if if the if the companies that are driving open source contributions to, to julia from industry if we're really putting out tools that allow basically other groups to adopt julia in industry in their companies and also even start companies around Julia, um, and we're we're all kind of, you know, in a cool collaborative zone because I think so many of like each of our companies, right? We have our specific domain, um, and I think the common the common tooling is it, it only is more powerful if we can if we can collaborate on it together. Um, so so yeah. So if, so at Beacon, one thing we focus on is being able to run Julia on Kubernetes in a very scalable way. And so we have a couple of open source packages released to that. Um, we're heavy users of, of Arrow for, um, for tabular uh, data serialization and, and manipulation communication. Um, so like integrating with these other like really great tools in other communities um, that are really useful in an industrial uh, in large scale data context uh, and then leveraging Julia in that context and then open sourcing tooling and patterns uh, for how how that works it is great, and I think I think this is this is kind of silly, but one thing we would like to do is probably publish more blog posts about like how we how we work on the, on that sort of stuff internally, um, because I think just not only the tools but also kind of the narrative of of how some of these things uh, how these puzzle pieces fit together can actually be really helpful at painting a picture for folks who who might be curious about that, and so. So if other companies are interested in doing that as well or have blogs, I think that's also a great a great thing that we can do. Um, yeah, Jared, I, I love that. The other thing that I wanted to call out that that you've been a part of was the, I'm, I'm not sure what the exact, I think it was a BOF, uh, a BOF at JuliaCon about industry uh, uses of Julia. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. Yeah, so so we, we, had a, we had a birds of a feather session where we talked about open source and in, in, uh, Julia usage in industry and uh, that actually spun out of a a a, a session that that Curtis Vogt, um, who is our principal software architect, uh, used to lead at, at previous Julia cons about Julia in production. Um, and I think one of the cool things that spun out of that was actually a, a hackathon all around getting uh, industry users of Julia to kind of contribute back in open source. So so I'd actually like to run this again. We we ran it uh, I believe uh, twenty in twenty twenty we ran it. Um, but I, I would, I would love to run another one where, uh, we, yeah, we basically have a bunch of folks from, from industry. Um, and part of the focus is just to have, uh, to give, to give folks a dedicated couple days to kind of sit down and, and then just focus on, okay, what tooling is internal that I can open source and then work towards, uh, doing that. Cause sometimes I don't know about you guys, but at Beacon, like, we just have a backlog of stuff that like is internal that like if we put a little elbow grease into it, we definitely could open source. Um, and so it's and so it's it's cool to give folks, I think, that that opportunity. And also it's a cool opportunity to see the potential collaboration points with other industry users. Like you find out, oh, turns out we've all been solving the same problem uh, of using AWS or whatever in this particular way. Like maybe we can share tooling around that. Um, yeah. and so, so I'd love to, I'd love to run another one of those maybe around the next JuliaCon or so. Yeah, that's a great idea, uh, Jared. I, I, I just heard you rattle off a few things that we're also doing and I'm like, we should be coordinating better. Yeah, yeah for sure. All right, Moham, Jared, we're going to hold you both, uh, to that and, and get you on the hook for a session at JuliaCon this year to hopefully facilitate, or hopefully it'll happen sooner than JuliaCon, but, um, definitely I'll, I'll reach out to both of you and remind you to send in that submission when the CFP opens. Um, Lyndon, Max, any, any last comments to add as far as, uh, opportunities for, for your companies and the, and the Julia ecosystem to sort of thrive, uh, in tandem? Yeah, for sure. So um, some of the open source areas that we collaborate a lot on, um, 
We're doing a lot in the Julia Diff automatic differentiation software. We need it to work, and therefore we're going to make it work for everyone else. Um, other areas are AWS.jl and the surrounding packages. That's something we work on, Beacon works on. It's a great example of what Jared was talking about, where we can collaborate on shared tooling, as well as um, a lot of areas around like Julia Data, uh, things like libpq is us, um, work around uh, fancy arrays. Um, so yeah, uh, we love to collaborate with people on any of our open source packages. That's why we open source them. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, I think thanks. Thanks for the, the answer, Lyndon. Max, anything last said? Otherwise we'll, uh, we'll close things off. And I know Max, you, you've been having trouble uh, connecting and joining and speaking as well. So I'm not sure if you can answer or not. But it looks like you're still having trouble. So I, I think we'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you all so much for, for being a part of this. I think hopefully folks who are interested in getting a job at any of the companies that are represented today have a better sense of, of you know, what they need to do, what the expectation is. Um, if you all want to uh, toss out a reply to the um, tweet on the Julia language account with a link to your careers page, I think that would be awesome for folks to um, find those open positions that you all have. Um, and that way they can uh, hopefully get in the door and, and start making Julia work better at all your companies. So thanks again for being here and uh, looking forward to, you know, hosting another one of these sometime in the future. Thanks, y'all. This was super fun. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. See ya.